Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're going to be talking about a new final rule that has been posted by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the United States for occupant protection for vehicles with automated driving systems. Now, this might sound a little bit boring, but as a part of this process, NHTSA has solicited and included feedback from automakers and other companies involved in the autonomous driving space. So there are actually quite a few different comments in here directly from Tesla about how NHTSA is writing this policy. Some of those comments may give us a hint at what Tesla has planned for the future. After that, and on theme, we have an updated safety report from Tesla we'll take a look at, and then I do want to revisit a couple of topics quickly from yesterday. Quick scheduling update before we get into those topics, Tesla today did announce that the Q4 earnings report, as expected, will take place after market close on Wednesday, January 27th. Generally, Tesla posts the financial results and a shareholder letter a few minutes after market close, and then at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, 11.30 p.m. UTC, they'll have a shareholder call, which generally lasts about an hour or so. A lot to look forward to there over the next couple of weeks. We'll definitely be doing a lot of earnings preview type of stuff. Q4 reports are always a little bit bigger because they are the year-end report, and that means we should get at least a little bit of guidance on their outlook for 2021. We continue to, at this point, only have rumors on the Model S and the Model X in terms of if they are actually being refreshed or if production has restarted, anything like that. If there is a refresh, Q4 would give them a really good opportunity to talk about some of the key elements of that. So, I don't know, that's a, a line in the sand at least or a date that we can look forward to in regards to the SNX as well. All right, so first things first on this new policy from NHTSA. This is a 146-page report. I've done my best to read as much of it as I can. I obviously haven't gotten through all of it yet. As with any government paper, it can be a little bit dry to read, but there's a lot of interesting stuff in here, so I will put the link to this in the description. So first off, the intent of creating a new policy like this is to adapt the safety protocols for an autonomous driving future. Per Bloomberg, NHTSA's deputy administrator explained in a statement, quote, with more than 90% of serious crashes caused by driver error, it is vital that we remove unnecessary barriers to technology that could help save lives. We do not want regulations enacted long before the development of automated technologies to present an unintended or unnecessary barrier to innovation and improved vehicle safety, end quote. After reading through a lot of this, I would say the gist of it is to create new definitions that are more fitting for how vehicles are going to be used in the future, to then align current safety protocols to those new definitions, or in the absence of an applicable safety protocol, to then establish new protocols. One of the big changes from that, and what the media has most picked up on so far, is that this will allow for different safety protocols for vehicles that don't necessarily have a designated driver seating position, or even any seating positions at all, for passengers. Obviously, if an autonomous vehicle is being used to transport cargo around and there is never going to be a person inside that vehicle, it should not be held to the same safety interior standards as a car that has passengers. You don't need airbags to protect your Amazon packages. If those were required, but there's never ever going to be a human in the car and there's not even seats or there's not even a steering wheel, that's just a burden that adds no value. So NHTSA here is trying to remove things like that while also ensuring that autonomous vehicles that have passengers in them are held to at least the same safety standards that passenger vehicles are today. That's where some of these new definitions, new terminology come into play because right now it's extremely clear in a vehicle which seat the driver's seat is and how you need to protect that seat. But in the future, that may not be so clear. Imagine if the steering wheel and the pedals are just gone, then you effectively have two passenger seats. So using that as an example, under this new policy, NHTSA is saying that in a case like that, you would essentially just mirror the safety standards for the front right passenger seat for what is no longer the driver's seat, but rather the front left passenger seat. So it's a lot of little things like that that need to be discussed and clearly defined because that provides the regulatory certainty for these manufacturers in this space. So where we're going to take our first look at some interesting feedback from Tesla is on the subsection on the driver's designated seating position. In the proposed changes that NHTSA had solicited automaker feedback for, they had defined that as a designated seating position providing immediate access to manually operated driving controls, which they go on to define those controls as a system of controls that are one, used by an occupant for real-time sustained manual manipulation of the motor vehicle's heading and or speed, and two, that are positioned such that they can be used by an occupant regardless of whether the occupant is actively using the system to manipulate the vehicle's motion. So basically what they're saying there is if you can immediately access the controls that drive the vehicle, whether you're using them or not, that designates a driver's seating position. So some of you may already be realizing, hmm, that seems like it might be a little bit limiting. So NHTSA says that many of the comments here were related to unconventional driving controls, things like joysticks or controls through screens. So they were arguing that controls should refer to something that is permanently attached to the vehicle in a fixed location. 
As for Tesla, Nitsa says that Tesla argued that the definition should consider situations where, for example, quote, the manual controls may be removable or where they may still be present but are locked or rendered inoperative when the automated driving system is in control of the driving task or where the vehicle may be operated remotely by portable steering controls within the vehicle, e.g. by cell phones or tablets, end quote. Tesla stated that the definitions may not fully consider the, quote, range of possibilities, end quote, of types of controls, such as, quote, buttons, joysticks, screens, and should not necessarily be determinative of whether the designated seating position should be considered a driver's rather than a passenger's seat for purposes of occupant protection, end quote. So a couple of things in there that I find interesting. The first would be that reference to locked or inoperative controls. So I think the first thing that would come to mind there would be the Tesla network. Sure, you probably don't want these riders to have steering control and speed control over your vehicle. You'd probably prefer that Tesla has that control. Although giving them the option wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world. Then you would have sort of a blend between something like Uber and Turo. So it wouldn't necessitate those controls being locked, but I think that's an obvious use case. Plus, if you're picking up someone like a child that doesn't have a driver's license, obviously the controls would need to be locked under that circumstance. What I think is also an interesting use case, though, is that clear delineation between when the human is either responsible for monitoring or controlling the vehicle and when Tesla is, because if those controls are locked up, that means Tesla is fully responsible. And when we talk about the differentiation between different levels of autonomy, I think that's one of the clear steps where you're going from level two up to level three and four. Level three, remember, is that in some circumstances, the vehicle can take over and it just needs to give you notice to take back over once a certain set of circumstances ends. So for example, if you're on a long highway drive, Tesla could take on that responsibility, lock those controls, and then just alert you ahead of time when you're going to need to take over as it prepares to exit the highway. Now, of course, when Tesla takes that control, it accepts that responsibility, it accepts that risk, versus right now, the driver is still responsible. I would have to imagine that at some point, probably not that far in the future, Tesla will feel comfortable taking on that responsibility, that liability, which they would obviously insure themselves against, to offer level three. Now, for full self-driving users, they would probably just get that as a part of the package, but for non-full self-driving users, think about the way that Tesla can monetize that. They could literally just charge per mile whenever anybody wants to engage that feature. How much is it worth for all these Tesla drivers out there to be able to completely check out on a significant portion of their drives with just a couple taps down on the gear selector? Tesla then takes complete control. They start charging you per mile completely seamlessly, just like they would charge you per minute or per kilowatt hour at a supercharger. Use cases like this are why it's not a good comparison to look at Uber's market or to look at the taxi market. There are so many more uses for autonomy than those allow for. And the beautiful part here is that all that hardware is on all Tesla vehicles. So even someone that's not interested in that, while that feature is still there in the background, they know they have access to it. And maybe one time they decide to try it out. And that, my friends, is a slippery slope because once you try it once, it's going to be really hard to go back. Then, of course, over time, hopefully as more data is collected, that level three moves up to level four, moves up to level five. And that's the ballgame, as they say. Anyway, getting back to the NHTSA policy, the other thing that caught my eye was Tesla's mention of having a remote operation system within the vehicle on your phone or tablet. Obviously, we've seen the early stages of some system like that with Summon, but you can bet this is something that Tesla is thinking a lot about. Their focus is on manufacturing, their focus is on bringing down cost. It sure would be beneficial in both of those areas to eliminate things like the steering column and the pedals. Elon has joked about those things many times in the past, you know, joked in quotation marks. You can almost guarantee that there is a design within Tesla for a Model 3 without a steering wheel or pedals. The symmetry of the vehicle helps for right-hand drive countries, but it also helps if there were no steering wheel at all. NHTSA did respond to both of these concerns raised by Tesla for the locked or inoperative steering controls. They say that they explicitly considered inoperative controls that remain in position. And then more interestingly, on the sort of remote operations or tablet control, they say that, quote, NHTSA does not believe Tesla's suggestion that the definition for manually operated driving controls account for the use of tablets or cell phones to control the vehicle is necessary at this time. The new definition is meant to encompass traditional driving controls, not future controls that have not yet been developed, end quote. A bit later, they also write, quote, Tesla sought clarity on whether remote operation fell into the definition of manually operated driving controls. In response, under the definition, the controls are positioned such that they can be, quote unquote, used by an occupant, Accordingly, the definition of manually operated driving controls excludes remote operation controls, end quote. This to me is misunderstanding what Tesla was asking. They're asking about remote operation being used within the vehicle by an occupant. Tesla was very explicit about that. They said, quote, or where the vehicle may be operated remotely by portable steering controls within the vehicle, end quote. 
So if they're not going to address that, that kind of just leads us back to their first statement where they say that they're not talking about controls that are not yet developed, for example, on cell phones or tablets. So I thought that part was a little bit odd. I'm sure Tesla's probably a little bit frustrated by that response there. Tesla is trying to get clarity on what the regulations are going to be, and it's really saying, well, we don't know yet because that doesn't exist yet. Figuring all that stuff out, though, seemed to be the whole point of doing this in the first place. Anyway, those comments were probably the most interesting ones that appeared here. There were a few others by Tesla. If you want to find them all, you can just open up the document, do a search for Tesla, they'll all come up. Probably the most interesting of the remaining comments were some from Tesla in regards to inboard seating and the safety protocols there. So inboard, meaning something like a center seat, and they specifically cited an example in one of their comments of where the center seat could fold and serve as both an armrest for outboard occupants and a foldable seat. A lot of people probably forget about this, but this is going to be the case for the Cybertruck with that center seat being able to fold down into an armrest or to have that third seat up front offering total seating of six. So nothing earth shattering there, but it seems like Tesla probably intends to continue to go forward with that design. All right, let's move on from the NHTSA report here, but we are going to stick with safety for just a second longer. Tesla has published their Q4 2020 accident data. So this is something they do every quarter. It's not perfect data, but it does give us a little bit of insight. So this compares accidents per million miles driven for various use cases. And we can start out with the benchmark from NHTSA that in the United States, there is an automobile crash every roughly half a million miles. Tesla then reports on three different circumstances. One, autopilot being active. Two, autopilot not being active, but active safety features are turned on. And then three, without autopilot and without active safety features. Tesla says that with autopilot engaged, they registered one accident for every 3.45 million miles driven in Q4. Without autopilot engaged, but with active safety features, that rate increased to one accident every 2.05 million miles. And then without autopilot and without active safety features, it increased further to one accident every 1.27 million miles driven. So first thing here, I strongly dislike the reporting methodology that Tesla uses for this. That autopilot engaged metric is a bit misleading because autopilot should be used in circumstances that are easier to navigate anyway. And based on how they report it, I assume that if autopilot is engaged and then asks you to take back control, becomes disengaged, and then you get in an accident, well, presumably that would not be reported in the autopilot engaged accidents. So the frequency should be lower there, especially when we consider that you're racking up miles a lot more quickly when you're traveling on the highway. So I haven't been able to find per mile accident data for on highway, off highway in general, but there are definitely differences in use cases here that make them not necessarily comparable how Tesla is comparing them. It is a little bit interesting though to compare that metric over time with itself. So actually in the third quarter, Tesla reported one accident every 4.59 million miles driven with autopilot engaged. So accidents were actually more frequent with autopilot in Q4. Obviously you wanna see that trending in the other direction. The thing here that's important to realize though is that Q4 presents trickier driving conditions than Q3 because of snow. So the frequency of accidents actually increased in all of these cases. So it went from 1.8 million miles driven to 1.27 million miles driven for cars that didn't have autopilot or active safety features in Q4. So much more frequent. Same thing for vehicles that have the active safety features but did not have autopilot on. The better comparison to make would be to Q4 last year. So Q4 last year with autopilot engaged, there was one accident every 3.07 million miles. So more frequent than Q4 this year. That's great. That's an improvement. For vehicles not on autopilot, but with active safety features, the accident rate was almost identical. And then for vehicles that didn't have either, the accident rate last year was 1.64 million miles driven. So less frequent than this year, but of course, that's just up to the drivers and how well they're doing. Going back one more year to Q4 2018, we see a similar thing. Accidents then, in that quarter, were more frequent, both with autopilot engaged or with autopilot off, but active safety features on. So difficult to take too much away from that, but at least good to see those improvements year over year. The other safety data that we get here from Tesla is vehicle fire data. So this used to be a much bigger deal, but just in case anyone is not familiar with this, Tesla says that from 2012 to 2020, there's been approximately one Tesla vehicle fire for every 205 million miles traveled. By comparison, in the US, on average, there is a vehicle fire for every 19 million miles traveled. Tesla vehicles are catching fire one-tenth as often as the average. Notably, that rate has actually been improving each year as well. All right, last couple of quick things for today. The first is on the recall that I mentioned yesterday for 158,000 Model S and X vehicles manufactured from 2012 to 2018. Turns out on Tesla's website, they actually do have an estimate for how much this cost. They say that the replacement part would cost $120 in parts, plus about an hour, hour and a half of labor. 
Many of you have correctly pointed out that Tesla does not have to replace the entire MCU. They can just replace that flash memory, which they are doing, changing the 8 gigabytes over to 64 gigabytes. So thanks for those comments. One of you has even shared your receipt from that service, which does show that $120 price. After labor, maybe that ends up being, you know, I don't know, $300. So I think worst case, you're looking at about a $50 million total cost here for Tesla, but not everyone is going to do this recall. Some of these vehicles would have already upgraded their MCU anyway, which would make them not need this. And many more when coming in for this service will probably just opt to upgrade anyway. So weirdly enough, Tesla actually gets a bit of opportunity there to upsell from a recall. Of course, that's not the situation you're going for, but hey, if people want to upgrade their vehicles, that's a convenient time to do it. Lastly then today, a couple people did ask when that ARC-X space exploration ETF might begin trading. Sounds like that'll happen around the end of March. So with that, we'll wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Friday, January 15th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.